Well, good morning, everybody. Thank you for being here for our monthly TREAD talk. It's good to see all of you out this morning. We're honored again this year to have uh, Dr. Robert Smith with us. Um, uh, Bob and his wife, Karen, have uh, been uh, dedicated to supporting our military month and our military day for, as we've been doing this, this is our fourth year doing it. Um, Bob was born in Nebraska and attended Nebraska University, where he majored in history. He has always had a love for history and a particular interest in military history as he comes from a military family. His father was a World War II veteran and a career Air Force senior NCO. Prior to his return to academia and advanced degrees, Bob managed a fam family operated business where he learned management and organizational skills. He returned to academia in 1998 attending Kansas State University, receiving a Master of Arts in Military History in 2004, and a PhD in Military History in December of 2008. Currently, he is the director of the Fort Riley Museum Complex out of Fort Riley. They just opened up one of the one, yeah. one of them. The brand new museum. A little bit about some of those. I haven't made it out there, but I hear it's amazing, so I'm anxious to get out there and see it. Um, after hours, he teaches military history through Kansas State University for Man program, Kansas University's Osher Lifelong Learning Program. He has co-authored a book in the history of Fort Riley and is the author of numerous articles on military subjects. If you've had a chance to walk around the museum floor prior to this, uh, this morning, you will have noticed that there are six various military vehicles on the display floor, spending decades of military history. This morning, Dr. Smith is going to share about modern day combat vehicles. And uh, so please join me in giving Bob a warm welcome. Thank you. Why, well, thank you, Doug. A um, couple of things before we get started. Uh, this is something I always have to do. Uh, my views are principally my views and not of the Department of Defense, the Center of Military History or the United States Army. And the second thing I wanted to say is most of the slides I show you is, I'm not privy to secrets and so I don't know, but all of this is open source material where I uh, gathered this material. And so today I want to talk to you about uh, the two, um, the M1 Abrams and the M2 Bradley. Uh, and first of all, I want to start off with a question. How many are Manhattan local residents here. Do you hear the booms? Okay, well that's what we're going to talk about today. So we tell everyone though if you hear the booms be ha very happy. That's the sound of freedom and so uh, anyway. So anyway I want to talk a little bit about the development of these two vehicles and uh, how they fit into the uh, the Army's scheme of things and war fighting abilities. So without further ado can everyone hear me all right? Okay, these are basically my notes, but uh, basically the development of armored vehicles came about in the, around the 1970s. Prior to that time, the United States was involved in what we call asymmetrical warfare. That was Vietnam, that is guerrilla warfare. Uh, it is uh, conflicts in which enemy combatants are not regular military forces of nation states. So in other words, guerrilla war. So why did the Army start to look at uh, this, uh, the military vehicles? Because uh, in asymmetrical warfare, uh, military vehicles are really uh, not that important. It's important when we start to talk about force on force warfare, where we're fighting a nation state. And so basically, uh, at the, uh, during the Vietnam War, uh, vehicles, military vehicles, namely the M48 tank and the M113 armored personnel carrier were basically uh, uh, battlefield tacti uh, taxis to get troops to a certain point or uh, the M48 as a kind of mobile pillbox to move around and use against guerrilla forces. So the uh, development actually came pretty much at the end of the Vietnam War when it was decided that the United States in future conflicts would probably be fighting something like the Soviet Union or the Warsaw Pact. An interesting point uh, is when I talk to my young soldiers through and I say the Soviet Union and they scratch their head and they say, what's that? And I say, Russia. Oh, okay, we, we know now. So, uh, but us older folks understand 
with the Soviet Union. So it was during the uh, Carter administration they determined the need that the Army would need new weapons because most of the weapons used during the Vietnam War were, and Lowell, I'm sorry, you're a Vietnam vet, these are, you know, these were pretty much World War II, 1950s technology, and so that had been, by the 1970s, had bypassed uh, the technological advances that were available. So anyway, but I thought I'd throw out just something really interesting. There was only one tank-on-tank -tank battle during the Vietnam War. It was on March 3rd, 1969, uh, at a place called Bien Het. And that particular battle, uh, a group of North Vietnamese PT-76s, we can see here one of the damaged ones, uh, attacked the Special Forces camp at Ben Het, and it was met by uh, some M48 uh, United States Army tanks. And there was a tank battle that ensued. And the tank battle, uh, the North Vietnamese got the, uh, probably the uh, poor end of the deal. They lost two uh, uh, PT-76. This is an amphibious tank that was given to the North Vietnamese by, uh, by the Soviet Union in the 1960s. Uh, there was a BTR-50, which is a, uh, 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 an armored vehicle that was also damaged in the war. But as we talk about, you know, tank-on-tank -tank battles, uh, Vietnam had very few, this being the only one. So anyway, uh, the Army decided that by the 1970s, we needed to upgrade our equipment, especially our tank, our MBT, which is a main battle tank, and our armored personnel carriers. And so the Army refers to those as the uh, big five. Only you're getting the short end of the deal today because I'm only going to talk about two of the big fives. So anyway, how do you have military success on a force on force when we start to deal with the Soviet Union and the Warsaw Pact nations in the 1970s and 1980? It was decided that the Army decided that the next future conflict that they need to prepare for would probably be in East, Eastern Europe and also in Central Europe uh, against the Warsaw Pact and the Soviet forces. And so we needed the Army needed to redesign and reconfigure uh, uh, the military vehicles and how they were going to be used in a force-on-force -force combat. And so the discussions came down to the technology. One of the great, one of the great uh, assets uh, that were to be considered on these new vehicles were speed, survivability, and good communications. Because it was decided, it was decided that in the 1970s into the 1980s, that if there was a conflict that broke out in uh, Central Europe against the Soviet and the Warsaw Pact, uh, that the United States could no longer guarantee a three to one, uh, uh, that there would be uh, no longer a three to one Soviet advantage there would be greater than that. Uh, and so we needed to be able to fight a war in which we were woefully outnumbered because the Soviet Union had quantitative uh, 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 vehicles uh, and troops on hand that we would need to fight something uh, with quality rather than quantity. And so it was decided that we would need to be able to score the first rounds in a battle, so our, our vehicles would have. Now this is what really, really shook the Army up in 1970s and early 1980s. It's what was called the Soviet Big Seven, and this is what we would be facing in any future conflict. And we found out that the M60 tank that we were fielding in the 1980s and the M113 armed personnel personnel carriers would not be uh, survivable with this quantitative uh, Soviet uh, weaponry. And so discussions came down to how to even the score, especially in a fight, you know, force on force fight. And so it was decided that there would be a major overhaul during the Carter administration and then the Reagan administration 
of military vehicles uh, for the United States Army. So, the big five. The soldiers still uh, come in and in my museum, in my 1st Infantry Division Museum, I have models of the big five and they immediately go, oh, that's the big five that, was, uh, that came about in the 1980s uh, and then proved itself so useful in the uh, first Persian Gulf War. So we would need a new MBT, a main battle tank, to replace the aging M60 tanks. We would need a new APC to replace the Army's 113 armored personnel carrier. There would be a new air defense system to replace the Hawk. And I love this, homing all the way killer system. I never knew that about the Hawk system, but uh, the, the Army's love for anachronisms, you, you can't beat it. There was somebody at the Pentagon that really had a sharp pencil that day. Okay, and then we would need a new attack helicopter to replace the Cobra. It was found that the Cobra did yeoman service in Vietnam, but the Cobra helicopter did not protect the pilots like it was uh, needed to be able to get down and dirty uh, with attacking uh, from the air. And then a new utility helicopter to replace the Huey, the venerable Huey. And so all of these weapons, though, all of these weapons would have to have 1980s technology. And this is the time, and I'm going to just throw this out. Um, about the 1980s, when you were starting to get the home computer in the home. And so now it was computerized. And so we needed to have that technology here integrated into our armored vehicles. It's gone a long way since then, folks. So what happens is the M60 up here becomes became the M1 Abrams tank. The 113, I call it the box on tread, to the M2 Bradley. The Huey became the Black Hawk helicopter. The Hawk system uh, became Patriot system and the Cobra turned into the Apache. And so this was the big five and how it fits into the Army scheme of things. And this was in the 1980s that uh, these weapons needed to be developed uh, for the new Army doctrine, which you probably heard many times when, if you remember the Gulf War, the land, air, sea combat. And so these would all be integrated into that combat uh, system. So another thing that really spurred the Army's interest in this is something that happened 50 years ago. In 1973, there was the uh, Arab-Israeli Gulf War. And we watched very carefully because the uh, Arab nations, Egypt and Syria most especially, were armed with Soviet equipment. And the Israelis who were uh, countering the uh, the Egyptian crossing of the canal and the Syrians moving into the Golan Heights, uh, basically were using American-made equipment. And so we looked very closely. The problem with the Gulf or the uh, Arab-Israeli War in 73, the Yom Kippur War, is the advent of the uh, anti-tank missile and how important it became on the battlefield. And so the Army started to look at why the anti-tank missile, you know, the, what we needed to do to counter any future uh, uh, conflicts uh, in which the anti-tank missile, the, uh, the tow missile, the target over ground missile, which was used to a very, very significant effect by the, uh, the Egyptians in the Sinai Desert. And so we started to look at the survivability of American vehicles or any advanced American vehicles. And so we needed to take in that. Uh, if you watch the news uh, uh, fairly frequently and you see that the uh, battles that are going on in Ukraine, the anti-tank missile has a premier place. And also now that uh, the drone, how the drone has actually become so significant. And so basically, given what we learned from the Israelis and what was watched on the battlefield and the ta changing tactics that we needed to develop weapons in which to counter, uh, especially the anti-tank missile. And out of that came the development of the M1 Abrams tank. 
It's named for this general here, General Creighton Abrams. He was the tank commander during the Second World War. Actually, Creighton Abrams was the first tank into Bastogne when it relieved the encirclement of Bastogne during the Battle of the Bulge. And so uh, Creighton Abrams was a very big advocate on armored warfare, and he also ended up, uh, after the Vietnam conflict, uh, working with what we call the Training and Army Doctrine Command. So he was actually developing, helping to develop the airland sea battle uh, that was used so effectively in the Gulf. And so the M1 Abrams tank came into being now. Okay, a couple of things about it is that uh, previous designs. In the 1970s, we joined with the Germans to create a hybrid tank that could be used both by the Germans and the West Germans and the United States Army. But uh, that did not come to be, and so uh, the Army turned to uh, uh, creating a new main battle tank, which was created by, does anybody have a Dodge Ram truck here by any chance? Its big brother is this tank here. It's Big Brother, and we'll, we'll talk about that in a minute here. But uh, the M1 was actually designed by Chrysler, and it actually has a Cummins engine in it, a uh, 1,500-horsepower engine. Uh, it, is, it does use a lot of fuel, though. That is one of its main drawbacks. But it has a top speed of 45 miles per hour, and it can really move on the battlefield. And so initially, we decided that we were going to use a 105 millimeter main gun. That was the main gun that was used on the M60 tanks uh, previous to this, but then it was de decided that after the first production batches that it was 120 millimeter. And what's really, really interesting is this 120 millimeter gun is a smooth bore gun. And the reason that it is a smooth bore gun is it can fire all different types of anti-tank and anti-personnel ammunition. And so the 120 millimeter seems to be uh, the uh, gun of choice. So the M1 Abrams entered service in 1980, and it still say, uh, through several iterations, it still serves the Army today. Okay. So entered service in the 1980s, and then it incorporated a lot of features that were not available in the uh, uh, earlier main battle tanks. One of the things that we wanted to do, that the Army wanted to do, uh, was, and when you think about it, it really makes a lot of sense, wanted to do was to increase the survivability of the crew. You can build a tank. You can build a tank in a rel relatively short amount of time <laughs> to create a efficient veteran tank crew takes much more time. So it was decided, Let's work on survivability of the tank crew rather than worry about the tank itself. So what's the survivability? Well, one of the things that's really interesting is what we call the bustle in the back of the, the turret. And that has the ammunition stored. So the ammunition is segregated from the rest of the tank. And so if you need a round, the door's open, the round goes in, and the door slams shut. And so if the tank takes a hit, it's, will survive, it will not cook off all the other ammunition. So that's the first point, is the survivability. The second point of survivability, have you noticed on the news, if you've watched any of the tanks in Ukraine or anything, they have little box-like figures all over the tank. That is called reactive armor. And that's if, if an explosive device hits that little box, that box explodes, and it sends the force of the charge away from the tank, and so it increases the survivability there. It also has a sophisticated NBC, so it's nuclear, biological, or chemical suite, so the group is protected. And so that's one of the other things. The other is that the M1 is powered by a 1500 gas turbine, and it gives the tank immense power. And like I said, it can cruise at 45 miles per hour. And so that's just incredible. And so this is the M1 tank. We did, uh, the, there is automatic loading systems. The, this automatic loading systems to load the main gun rather than have the soldier actually push 
the shell into the breach. Uh, this was pioneered by the Russians back in the 1970s, and we had, we had looked at it for a while, and we found out, though, that there's a lot of drawbacks with the Russian, uh, the way they designed it, because uh, the joke used to be, uh, you see a lot of, and it's, there's a lot of truth to the joke, you see a lot of uh, one-armed, left-armed uh, Russian tankers around, because usually with that automatic loading system that it would grab the, as you're moving the shell into position, it would grab your arm too and jam it into the breech, and it would fire your arm and the charge out. So uh, it's, it's something that the, uh, the Russians had to deal with. So what is the future? We have gone through many iterations of the M1 Abrams tank. Now, the M1 that, was uh, that has been uh, sent to the Ukrainians <coughs> is the first version, the M1A1. We are, I believe, into the fourth iteration of the M1. But the future Abrams X tank, or 10 tank, is going to look something like this. And basically, uh, one of the things that the Army wanted to uh, rectify with the M1's Abram is its voracious thirst for fuel. And so now we're, they're working on a 50% reduction in the fuel used by the tank. And so that 50. It's also, interestingly enough, that offers a hybrid power pack that enables the silent watch capability. And that means that the, it can run certain systems without the entire tank being run. And so we can now be a little more stealthy. It also will contain artificial intelligence. OK, what are we talking about? Artificial intelligence for tanks are target acquisition, also uh, threat identification. I was talking to uh, someone here just a little while ago, and I said, I watched something the other day. Uh, about the Merkava Israeli tanks, and it was just astounding uh, that they have a system on their Merkava 4 tanks now, open source, so I'm not giving you any secrets here from the Israeli army. Uh, they actually have two pods on the turret of their tank, and when a rocket-propelled grenade or a shell is uh, within the 180-degree uh, sensor system on the Merkava, this pod will open up and fire small pellets out, detonating that incoming round way away from the tank. It's just incredible. that, And this is not crew sponsored. This is uh, artificial intelligence uh, where the tank is picking up this threat and dealing with it so the tankers don't have to worry about that. So there's going to be artificial intelligence systems on this new tank. Uh, which is going to make it more lethal, survivability, mobility, and incorporating manned and unmanned systems. So the tankers are not going to have, you know, to worry about certain issues because the armored intelligence, uh, the, uh, uh, the artificial intelligence is going to actually assist that. Now, what about the M2, the uh, uh, Bradley? Uh, vehicle. Well, I have armored boxes here, and the army, army from the 1950s all the way into the 1970s uh, had created uh, something very much akin to the M113. M75 was actually this particular vehicle was the first one. This turns out to be a battlefield taxi. Battlefield taxi. It takes troops too. What it doesn't do is provide the infantry support that infantries need. And it was a wake-up call for the United States Army in the 1970s when the Soviets started to field their BMP-type vehicles, which actually had a uh, infantry support weapon on the vehicle, plus it had the area in which soldiers could actually ride to the battlefield and actually fight from uh, the vehicle. And uh, none of these actually did it. There were times, and I'm going to talk to you Vietnam vets, when uh, the M113 came, there were all kinds of uh, uh, adaptations to the M113. The problem is, is this is a speedy little vehicle, but the other problem is, in order to be lightweight, it's made of aluminum. And the Army found out that aluminum burns. And so the problem is, is that we need to have survivability for our infantry soldiers. And so, but these vehicles, the 75, the 59 that replaced the 75, and then probably the M113, uh, 
uh, is, uh, and it's it actually in still operation uh, today with, with some armies. But what we wanted to do, what, was wanting, what the Army wanted to do was create a vehicle that could take this particular vehicle. This is a B, uh, BMP-1, uh, the Soviet Army. And what it is is it provides a weapon for support here, but it also can take six soldiers in here and they can actually fight from this vehicle. And we had nothing like that. And so it was decided that the M2 Abrams would be very similar to this, but more robust, faster, and uh, it, it has proven itself over time to be the, uh, the vehicle, uh, the support vehicle that the infantry need. So the Bradley is not only an infantry support fighting vehicle, but it also can be a tank killer with its weaponry. And this came off the line in 80, 1980. It was adopted uh, and accepted the vehicles in 1981. Now, the question becomes, the question becomes, this is 1980s technology, and we are updating, updating, but there are more things to come. You know, the Army is constantly thinking about a replacement for these vehicles. And so, what we have here is the specs. Oh, look at that. I'm sorry. It's not very readable. But basically, the, the only thing is, is it has a speed of 40 miles an hour. One of the things for the M1, M2 Bradley armored fighting vehicle is that it needed to keep up with that stallion we have called the M1 uh, Abrams tank. And so it has the same, uh, a very similar speed, and it also has some incredible, incredible weaponry. It has a 25 millimeter Bushmaster. Now, I'm going to teach you a little Fort Riley lore here. Those of you that hear boom, that's usually an M1 tank out on the ranges doing their targeting tables and things like that. It could be a Paladin uh, self-propelled gun, boom. But if you hear boom, 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 that's that Bushmaster out there, that they're practicing with that Bushmaster and doing their, their tables. And uh, so it has that. It also has two uh, in side sponsons, uh, tow missiles, so it is a tank killer. And it is decided by the Army that if this thing gets into a fight and it can't handle the fight, it can get out really quickly. And so it's, again, it's a question of survivability for the crews because it takes time to train a, an efficient crew, but the, uh, but the vehicle can be replaced rather readily. Is that one also turbine powered? That is, yes. So here's the Cummings engine here. The Cummings engine. 1,000, up to 1,000 horsepower. Uh, it harnesses opposed pistons. Now, I'm not a gearhead, but I thought this is really interesting that it is actually, it's a four-cylinder vehicle and actually uh, displacement with just four cylinders. And so on the commercial market, I thought this was so interesting that if you have a six-cylinder, 6BT engine in a heavy-duty Ram truck, you have the son of this Cummings engine here. Okay, one more thing. I've been talking about artificial intelligence, uh, maneuver and mobility, and this is what the Army is driving, uh, driving towards. Now, one of the things is we're thinking, the Army is also thinking about autonomous <coughs> driving vehicles. The tank will drive itself with using AI intelligence. And so that's it. And then identifying the threats. And here I talk about uh, the Barak, and here's the Merkava tank that you see on the news most every night, uh, is that the, that the tankers are now using in Israel a helmet, which gives you a 360 degree uh, ability to see. And you can have those sensors on the exterior and the peripheral vision. So it's basically like a fighter pilot. You can see over the horizon, over the horizon sensors of any threats that you have. One of the great uh, issues or the advantage, advances of the uh, M1 tank during the Gulf War and the tankers have talked about this many times, is that the M1 Abrams, with its advanced optics, could actually see 
the Iraqi tanks before they even knew they were there, that they had the range and the distance and the uh, tremendous optics. And so uh, those optics are being actually added on and upgraded constantly. And so basically what we're going to have is that we're going to have in the near future uh, a tank that can recognize the threats and also give the tankers inside the tank survivability, but also 360 degree all around vision. You know, any of you have ever been in a tank, you know your vision is pretty much uh, limited. Yeah, and so now this is being rectified. So, today's conflict, we offering any clues to the new types of tanks that we're going to see probably in the next 20 years throughout the world? Well, a couple of things. Survivability of the crew, that is primary, uh, primary issue. Autonomously operating AFVs, they're going to be driving themselves. We have self-driving cars now. There's the technology to drive itself. Uh, AI in assessing any threat, whatever's coming at you, whatever's coming at you, it will identify that threat and immediately respond to that, much quicker than the human, humans can. Storage of ammunition away from the crew. And I want to actually jump here in a minute and show you something. St remember storage ammunition away from the crew. Fuel economy. The new Abrams tanks with its new engines, its new Cummings engines, gonna, they're shooting for 50% less fuel consumption than that. And then this is really incredible. This is on the market today and you can actually look it up. But now there's technology to make tanks invisible to the opposing forces. It's almost like, okay, Star Wars, Star Trek, cloaking devices. That's actually, not, that's not science fiction. That's something that's being worked on yet today. Okay, now, remember this storage of ammunition away from crew. My final slide here. This is a Russian tank and this is from Ukraine. If you notice, their ammunition storage is in the tank itself and in the turret. So you're going to see a lot of times when a tank is hit, that turret, that many ton turret is gonna pop off and land and this is what we're doing away. This is the tank of the future. This is not an American tank. This is developed by Poland. And this is the Poland, and this is the one that they're working on cloaking devices right now. So this is the wave of the future. And so this is the present, and this is where we're heading. So it's becoming almost science fiction in the way that the military are looking and using AI uh, to assist in its war fighting capabilities. Any questions? And by the way, uh, I, will t uh, I will point out one thing. If I don't know the answer, I'll make something up. But uh, <laughs> the second thing is, and you'll know it's the truth, that I'm speaking from some authority because I, I had a uh, uh, gentleman come to talk to the troops la uh, about a week and a half ago and we were laughing because we were both historians. He's an author of many, many books and he had his corduroy jacket on and I said, that's the sign of a professional historian. We have a rumpled corduroy jacket. <laughs> and he says, the only problem is uh, you don't uh, I don't have, he didn't have, uh, the patch pockets on the sleeve, and I said, yeah, but I do. <laughs> so anyway, I'll be happy to entertain any questions if I can. Yes, sir. Okay, so just a few minutes ago, you mentioned the words amphibious tank. Can you expand upon that just a little bit? Because that doesn't really make sense to me. Okay, uh, the, uh, ever since the beginning of armored warfare, there has always been an amphi uh, there has been a move towards amphibious tanks. The PT-76, which the North Vietnamese used, was actually uh, designated an amphibious tank and could actually uh, wade up into, I think it was uh, uh, 11 or 12 feet of water that it could actually wade because the PT-76 had actually two jets on the back, just like a boat jet, that when it got into the water, you could disengage the engine from the drivetrain and engage the jets. The United States, uh, and had amphibious tanks during the Second World War. They actually came ashore at Omaha Beach and in Utah Beach, and they were called DD tanks. They were uh, uh, dupl what we call duplex drive tanks. And the, basically what you did is before you went into the water, 
and you imagine a many ton Sherman tank, you would put this canvas shield up around and turn it into a floating tank and that it would be. The problem is, is that uh, when the DD tanks were uh, tested, they were tested in a lake in Britain and they worked fabulous. But when they came to the channel and very choppy seas, a lot of them were swamped and they're still at the bottom of the, the, the channel. But there is also, uh, tanks would be using snorkel to cross river obstacles because uh, river obstacles and uh, actually amphibious landings. So there are uh, 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 amphibious tanks, they're still working on it. I won't be able to comment too much on the ability of the, uh, the M1, an amphibious, but we're still trying to make tanks float. Yes, Lowell? 113 was amphibious. <laughs> but up to what? Okay. I just hate to be in a you know, multi ton vehicle and try and wade through, I mean, given my swimming abilities and things. But <laughs> I think that the, uh, uh, the 113, though, is considerably lighter than the, the M48s that were actually sent to Vietnam. So the Marines have their amphibious vehicles. They have their LTVs, yes. They have an, they actually a fully amphibious vehicle. There's just a brand new LTV uh, that the, uh, the Marines are, which is surprising because the Marines up until the 1990s were still using, uh, and even into the 2000s, the M60, the old 50s tank. The Marines don't like to give up their equipment uh, because they've... they've tank in Korea. They had a... The old tanks. In Korea. Mm -hmm. And they had the, and there's still some, I think there's still some Cobras flying for the uh, uh, helicopters for the Marine Corps. So basically, uh, it is. Now, that being said, uh, one other thing, uh, please come out to my museums to see. I have a number of armored vehicles out in front of the museum. Uh, I'm one of the few people uh, on post uh, that basically I says, I have artillery, I have uh, tanks, and so don't go to war with me. So I do have an M1 too. Yes, sir. About the side skirts on the tanks supposed to detonate anti-tank weapons. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And I understand uh, there is a uh, the M1. I did not mention, but the M1 Abrams tank is uh, utilizes what's called Chobham, C H O B H A M armor, which the British developed, and it's still very secret. Uh, how that army uh, armor is. I would imagine it's some sort of compo composite materials there, though. Yes? Where are these uh, manufactured at? Uh, actually, the, the, there's the, uh, it's called uh, General Dynamics Land Systems, and these are manufactured here in the United States. I don't, I'm not actually sure. I'd have to check on that. But yes, they're actually, it used to be Chrysler, but then General Dynamics took it over, and they uh, have, uh, but I do know that they're all built here in the United States. Yes, sir. That big four-cylinder Cummins, is that the technology that's going to cut the fuel consumption? By uh, that's actually the engines that are being used now, and they're working on a Cummins that will cut the fuel consumption <laughs> down. And so those are replacing the turbines. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you know when they start up because they are loud. Yes, sir. How do you get to the museum at, the, at Fort Riley? Oh, wonderful question. I didn't put you up to this, sir, did I? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, uh, it's it's very easy. You come in on the I-70 exit. To Marshall Army Airfield, you see all the helicopters out there, you know. So you come in on that gate. Uh, at that gate, there is a visitors control center, and it's really cool what they do. In order to get on the post, given the times we live in, uh, if you have your license with you, well, you should. Uh, you take your license out. There's a little kiosk, and you put your license in there. It takes your picture. Out comes a little piece of paper, and you're to the museum and you can go in. And the gate guards will look at it. And so it does a very quick, what they call a very basic background check with your license and everything. And uh, easy, easy to get on post. But sure. love to have you. I keep telling my headquarters located in, uh, in, uh, in DC uh, that, uh, yeah, I've been closed for four years. So my visitation has sucked, but it's getting better. <laughs> yes, sir. A little war story. Years ago, I was 
Well, I think even CRDT in Washington, and we got a T-55 Soviet tank, mm -hmm. really, put a gas turbine in it. For propulsion, we also had one where we pressurized the inside of the tank so that you'd keep the bad stuff out, which is exactly what ended up in the M1. Mm -hmm. Also, the same system, I was a development engineer on the Apache helicopter, which is exactly the same. I know you're not talking about helicopters, but it's the same concept. How do you keep the bad stuff out? You overpressurize the inside of the cockpit and keep it out. And the interesting thing on the gas turbine world, on both the tank and a helicopter, you can't bleed off the main stage of a turbine engine because you lose the horsepower of it. So what I developed, or my company developed, was a small onboard APU gas turbine, which you run both in the tank as well as the patch. Uh -huh. And you pressurize the inside and you don't bleed off the engine so he can sit there and fight in the barbell. So just a war story that many years ago played with before the <laughs> It's really, really incredible at, uh, at Fort Riley that you can actually, uh, you hear the booms a lot, but a lot of the uh, training is done at the, uh, and I don't know if you're familiar, they have a sim center. And actually it is like video games on steroids. Oh. And you can actually get into a M1 tank, you have all your, uh, uh, equipment there it's actually sitting in a building there's a whole line of them you can crawl in those and then you can operate the M1 and do your training in there and the the good thing about that is you're not using expensive ammunition so you as taxpayers you know aren't paying for all of the you know constant boom booms but you're actually doing it in there I had the opportunity quick story about myself I had the opportunity uh, to go in one of those. They said, come on, Bob, get in one of these Bradley fighting vehicles and you can, uh, you know, try an, uh, an exercise. I lasted all of 20 seconds <laughs> before I was hit. Uh, what, what's happening? Nothing's responding here. And I said, you're hit. You're dead. And <laughs> so. What's the, what's the explosion that shake my house? Those, I would imagine, those are either the Paladin uh, 155 millimeter howitzers firing, or it's probably the M1 uh, tank, uh, tank, actually. Because every once in a while it shakes. It will shake. I, I had an opportunity, uh, they sent me out and said, oh, you should see one of these, and I, you know, I invited someone from K-State, a history professor from K-State, out to watch um, uh, some training exercises. And before those training exercises began, sir, they hand us out earplugs, because you may be thousand feet away from that tank, you're going to still hear it. Yeah. It's going to make a noise. Yes, sir. Well, I think, Bob, we've moved up to the M2 now, Abram tank. We're, I think, in the already up to like the four. Yeah. Yeah, we're up to, we're, we're moving up. We keep, they're constant upgrades. Now, the Bradley itself had about 13 breakout boxes to do tests and everything on it. And the M1, you had a test on the inside to do it. It traversed the territory up and down and everything. The only thing is, if you messed up, you had to start all over again on that test. Now, the M1 itself for the driver is that the driver had to keep his head down inside there because if he had to bring his head up, when it traversed, it would take his head off. It's, let me see here. And I'm one just like riding a mo driving a motorcycle. You can sit down there just like this and drive it. I drove one of them and worked on them. You can see it real well here. You can see where the, the driver is. Yep. And the one thing is, is uh, that the, we're cutting down crew sizes. I think the, the M1, you have three crew, three crew members in there now rather than the, the old four. Yeah, hello. Some of the loud booms may be the mobile launch rockets too. They could be. It could be that, too. But uh, uh, like I said, if you hear those booms, uh, you know, those soldiers are out there training. And we still have, no matter what you hear on the news, we still have the best trained and most lethal fighting force in the, in the, in the world. Well, the M60 had a trap door inside where you can crawl out. The M1, forget it. There ain't no door inside where you can't crawl out. I uh, have a, uh, a bunch of vehicles out in front of the museum here, you know, World War II vehicles, and I had some ROTC students come through a couple of years ago, and we were talking, and the, the one was looking at it and says, hey, is there a, a, a belly uh, 
door on the, uh, the Sherman? And I said, yes, there is. He says, can I look? And he says, uh, you know, knock yourself out, crawl under the tank. And uh, he crawled out, and boy, he scattered out right away. Uh, and he says, there were two eyes looking at me. And I says, there's probably a raccoon living in there, so. <laughs> but he took off. Yes, sir. So uh, I spent six years in the Army. I was supposed to be a tank mechanic and never touched a tank once. But I heard rumors that uh, the uh, M1 could go faster than 45. Is there any truth to those rumors? I can neither confirm nor deny that. That's the standard answer when. <laughs> the new M1 can go up to 65 miles an hour. Well, the, th the thing is, is, the main thing is, is just basically the fuel consumption is so great on these. If you notice, you know, and you can Google this, if you look at the Persian Gulf War in the 90s, you can see the tankers lined up, you know, unfueling those because they went, went for broke, you know, hey, we have a gap. And the gentleman uh, that I said had, uh, that's the historian, was actually a uh, colonel, and he was involved in the major tank battle in the first Gulf War, what was called uh, Fright Night. And basically, we were talking one day, and said the, yeah, he said, we, you know, the only thing that's slowing us down was, hey, we needed fuel, because those, those tanks just drank it. So thank you, Doug. Thank you, Bob. Thank you.